NFL Week 14 line moves and Zuma. Before we dig into the Week 14 card, let's zoom out and talk big picture for a moment. Some big injuries when we look at Lamar and Jimmy G going down this past Sunday. How do those injuries affect your outlooks moving forward for Baltimore and San Francisco? Yeah, so with Baltimore, it's a little bit easier, I would guess, because Tyler Huntley will likely only play two weeks. So two weeks is kind of the um, average missing time for this type of injury. I think it was a PCL sprain for Lamar Jackson. So for the Ravens, it will only be two weeks against the Steelers on the road. Probably not the easiest matchup for a backup quarterback. And then they will play um, at Cleveland. I mean, both games have high leverage effects in a what's what what might be a wide open um, AFC North right now. So, um, yeah, I think when it comes to Tyler Huntley, we got to discuss or project what's going to happen in the next two games. The Browns have not looked very good last week against the Texans. But I think for the Niners, it's kind of a different story. I'm just checking the, 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 the standings. Uh, Ravens still first in their division. Uh, Browns three games um, behind them. Steelers three games behind them. Um, yeah, I mean, the Bengals look very legit, so it could be a, a an approach for, for the Ravens to just survive the, the next two weeks, maybe go 1-1, one, one, and then you have uh, Lamar Jackson back back um, f- to finish the season. For the Niners, it's a little bit um, tougher because Jimmy Garoppolo will likely not be back before the divisional round if they even get there. Um, Brock Purdy looked, let's say, kind of decent against the uh, the Dolphins last week, but we have zero clue how it's going to look like going forward. I mean, he was Mr. Irrelevant for a reason, like 250 and uh, 252 or something was his final position. So uh, 32 teams decided that he was not worth more than a late seventh round pick. Uh, he has a very low prior when it comes um, to his NFL projection. We only have one data point um, against a defense that was not able to prepare for him. Um, we, we simply have no clue how it's going to look like going forward. We have to assume that it's a downgrade from Jimmy Garoppolo because whatever people think about Garoppolo, he, um, or the Niners had a top five efficiency offense um, over the past two seasons and in 2019 i think they ran eighth offensively in dboa so um drew Garoppolo always touted as the game manager but he's also always executing the Kashanian offense at a very high level so brock sturdy purdy can only be a downgrade from him but by how much we will find out over the next couple of weeks um the niners are still one game ahead in the nfc west they still play the Seahawks in a head-to-head matchup. Seahawks have the advantage that they have four home games to close out the season, just one road game at Kansas City. Um, if the Seahawks, Seahawks can beat the Niners, there is a path for the Seahawks to win the N- NFC West, I would argue, and for the Niners to maybe only sneak into the in, in, um, sneak into the playoffs with a wild card wild card berth. But yeah, I mean, we will find out over, over the next couple of weeks. Um, most certainly, he will be a downgrade from Jimmy Garoppolo. But in this um, environment, uh, with that uh, supporting cast, it might not be the biggest downgrade. As you've given context to the injuries affecting the Ravens and the Niners with Jackson and Jimmy G having gone down this past Sunday, you've mentioned some of the other contenders in both the AFC and the NFC. How are these quarterback injuries affecting your outlook on the futures betting market beyond the Ravens and 49ers themselves? I think when it comes to the NFC, um, the upper tier got reduced by the 49ers. Because right now, I'm not willing to put the Niners up there with the Cowboys and the Eagles if there's a seventh-round rookie quarterback playing um, under center. I just cannot do this. I I will need to get more confirmation in the upcoming weeks that Brock Purdy can somehow execute that offense to the level that uh, Jimmy Garoppolo did. But 
Uh, yeah, Niners got downgraded, um, at least in my book. Eagles and Cowboys are now uh, really the cream of the um, NFC. Eagles with the likeliest path um, to hopeful advantage throughout the playoffs and having that bye week. Um, yeah, and then after that, there is the, the 49ers right now. And then in my opinion, there's also another gap towards the next couple of teams like the Buccaneers and uh, the Vikings. And using those quarterback injuries from week 13 as a jumping off point, diving into the week 14 slate, let's go out of rotation order just a bit to stay on topic here and talk about the Ravens heading to Pittsburgh to take on their rival Steelers. Some interesting movement in the point spread here. Pittsburgh opening a two point favorite, got up as high as three. Then we saw some buyback on Baltimore. Currently the Steelers laying two and a half minus 115 and Suma on one hand, Huntley has some familiarity with this Ravens system, of course, and also a lot of stylistic similarities to Lamar Jackson. He might be a poor man's Lamar, if you will, but those similarities might lend a bit of a schematic edge to the Ravens going to their backup quarterback in a pinch. On the other hand, the Steelers, speaking of familiarity, they faced Huntley last year in week 18, and I think that that familiarity might give an advantage to Pittsburgh. You talked about Miami not being able to prep for Brock Purdy. Well, the Steelers should know what they're getting in Huntley this week. So what do you make of this line movement? Steelers currently, again, laying two and a half, shaded toward a, a home favorite of minus three. Yeah, with the look ahead line, um, I was only checking the look ahead line at DraftKings, which was around Pittsburgh plus four as a home underdog against the Ravens and Lamar Jackson. This was now out to minus three. And then we saw some buyback on the Ravens. I think that the market told us that at least for now, in, in the early in, in the early week, that the three was probably the ceiling where the number could go for the Steelers to be to be laying at home against Tyler Huntley. Um, yes, Tyler Huntley is a downgrade from Lamar Jackson, but there's also an issue that even with Lamar Jackson, this passing game for the Ravens was extremely limited. Like they really lacked that explosive passing game since Rashad Bateman went down. There was only Mark Andrews, a bunch of wide receivers who struggled to create separation. Isaiah likely also got injured last week, I guess. Ronnie Stanley is probably 50-50 to play at this point. Um, John Harbour was just hopeful that he would go, but he won't know until later in the week. So there was still some injury trouble. And the Steelers, after playing arguably the toughest schedule among all teams this season, they have looked really good in recent weeks. Um, they went 3-1 and one and they only just came against the Bengals where they went toe-to-toe -to -toe until early in the fourth quarter, I guess. So we have one team in the Steelers whose offense looked better, whose defense is um, getting healthier against a team that is somehow limited uh, in terms of their passing offense and will play a backup. So, um, yeah, I think that the that the market will like uh, the Ravens um, as soon as it um, touches uh, towards a field goal. So I would not be surprised if this number bounces around a little bit more between two and a half and three until we get a little bit more clarity in terms of injuries later in the week. Another high leverage game flirting with a field goal hopping over to the NFC Minnesota at Detroit. This one opened pick them and now we're seeing the Lions favored by two and a half shaded toward the three minus 115 vig attached to that minus two and a half for Detroit. Suma, as you wrote on the hammer dot bet, the downfall of the Vikings feels almost inevitable. Guys, here are some numbers from football outsiders. Uh, total DBOA. Detroit Lions on the season, 13, Minnesota Vikings, 20. I mean, <laughs> even over the course, course of the season, the Lions rank seven spots higher in DVOA than the Vikings. If you look at all the games where the um, Vi uh, Lions had somewhat of a healthy offense with Armand Rice and Brown healthy, etc., um, this offense has put up top 10 efficiency numbers this season. Um, there's also another interesting stat, like Jared Goff with Amon Ross and Brown on the field. This is from True Media. Open two EPA per dropback that would rank fourth out of 32. And Goff without Amon Ross and Brown on the field, minus 0 0.09 EPA per dropback that would rank 30th. So there's a drastic split 
with um, Amal Ross and Brown on the field, off the field. And since Sam Brown recovered mm -hmm. from his, I think it was a high ankle sprain or a medium high ankle sprain, since he recovered from that and is fully back healthy, this offense is really rolling. They have a decent offensive line. Jared Goff is playing well, especially at home. He has some crazy home road splits. And they are just starting to work their first round rookie into the lineup. So right now, there is, in my opinion, not a single case to be made that the Vikings should be laying anything over the Detroit Lions on a neutral field right now. And I think that the early market move uh, would agree with that, pushing this line towards minus two and a half, minus 15 at Circa. I mean, this is right now shaded towards at home. It tells us, tells us everything we, we need to know about the Lions and the Vikings. And the Vikings, I think they won 10 games and eight or nine of those were close games. The Lions, on the other hand, lost a few close games early in the season. So if there was just some, let's say, flippening in, in terms of close games for both teams, we might be looking at the Lions as an eight-win team and the Vikings as a seven-win team, for example. So right now, there is simply not really anything separating both teams. And I would make the case that the Lions offense is in a better state right now than the Vikings. So yes, um, if you put all, all, all of that together, it's, I think, completely rational that the Lions are laying two and a half points against the, against an overrated Vikings team at home right now. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, would we be shocked if this touches three later in the week? I would expect that there will be some heavy buyback on the Vikings at, at plus three. But I would not be shocked at, the, at this point if, if there was going to be a little bit more Lions money. It might be tough to tell whether there's much separation between Minnesota and Detroit. Not so tough. Apologies to Jacob to see the separation between the Eagles and the Giants, whom they'll be taking on at MetLife Stadium this week. But we've seen more interesting movement on this game. As far as the total is concerned, an opener of 43 and a half, crossing through a couple of key numbers up to 45 and a half. Suma, what do you see as the driving force behind the over money for this Eagles-Giants matchup? I just think that 43 and a half was a tad too low um, from, a, from a market perspective because the Eagles have a very good offense. The Giants have a bad defense. The Eagles are laying seven. So that one matchup on that side looks to be very favorable for, for a potential overplay uh, when the number is in the, in the low 40s. On the other hand, the Eagles, uh, despite shutting down the Titans for the most part, they benefited from Traylon Burks going down early in the game. Um, and the Giants over the course of the season have also shown some better um, offensive play than the Titans overall. Um, Daniel Bell Bellinger is back. The offensive line is starting to get healthier for the Giants. The Eagles are still missing Chauncey Gardner-Johnson and Avante Maddox. Um, they, their safety and linebacking corp is not that great. So there's probably some room for the Giants' offense to attack. And I think that in general, it was just a play on the total being below the, the key number of 44. Moving on to a pivotal AFC North matchup for the second time in this show, we will say that the Bengals hosting the Browns. Cincinnati opened up minus four at a lot of shops, minus five at Circa. And across the board, that's up to Cincinnati minus six. And I can totally say that it makes sense in my book. Suma, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. For the Browns, Deshaun Watson looked the part of somebody who hadn't played an NFL snap for 700 days. And when it comes to the Bengals, it's getting to the point where it's really tough for me to see much separation at all between how good they are and how good the other elite teams of the AFC are in the Bills and the Chiefs. Yeah, I mean, the Bengals look like a legend Super Bowl contender right now. Their defense is decent despite having some injuries uh, on the back end, and their offense is really looking incredibly awesome right now. Um, their run game has gotten better. Jamar Chase is back. Joe, Joe Brew looks even better than, than last year. They are not just relying on all those uh, go routes anymore. Um, there's a lot more to it uh, than, than it was last year. The Browns defense is not great. Their rushing defense is, is, is bad. Their passing defense is not great at all. Um, and also, I mean, I would not overreact to Deshaun Watson's first game after that uh, suspension because that was so bad. 
it's very tough to to repeat that. So the the medium um, expectation median expectation for the Sean Watson is a, a lot higher than what he's shown uh, has shown us last week. But also um, David Njoku was not available last week, and during the game uh, the Browns lost Anthony Schwartz and David Bell, their wide receivers three and four two injuries. Uh, Schwartz has a concussion. Bell has, an, has a head injury. We don't know about David Njoku yet. So there is a, a chance that the Browns receiving group, which is not deep to begin with, will be even more um, limited this week. So that's something to, to keep an eye on. Um, I think Bengals laying six against the Deshaun Watson Browns at home makes some sense right now. We gotta watch those injuries, um, whether whether it gets whether it will get a little bit poorer for the for the Browns, but um, as of right now, I think that when the when the market was in no man's land, uh, around four and a half, five and a half, um, there was only one arrow pointing towards six for the Bengals. And as we're recording this show, seeing the screen light up a little bit, Suma, let's talk Titans Jags for a moment. I see that. Tennessee has seen some money going from minus three and a half up to minus four. And the total has ticked down from 41 and a half to 41. Going to put you on the spot a bit. What do you make of this Wednesday morning movement, Wednesday morning Pacific time movement on both the side and the total for Jags Titans? Let me quote Ian Rappaport. Um, Jaguars coach Doug Peterson said quarterback Trevor Lawrence has a foot injury from that scary hit on Sunday. And he's day to day. His status for Sunday is up in the air. So that's what's driving this market move. It was three and a half, and we were all waiting for uh, some injury news out of Jaguars camp. And yeah, um, right after the game, it looked a, li uh, a lot more optimistic. Uh, Lawrence was coming back into the game. There were rumors about a knee sprain. Uh, maybe he would get some swelling, but he might be ready next week. And now Doug Peterson is saying that he will not practice today, and he can't say whether he's going to play on Sunday. So that's uh, that's driving the Jaguar uh, the Titans money right now. Market is sitting at uh, four minus fifteen. Chris uh, minus four at Circa. Pinnacle took the game off the board. Um, we gotta monitor the status. If it trend, tends towards uh, Trellons not playing, this line will go up towards six uh, seven ish in that area because I mean Trevor Lawrence has been playing really well in recent weeks and. Um, if he's not going to pay it, this will be a major downgrade for the Jaguars against against the Titans, who can who might be able to run the ball on the Jags. From a game lighting up in real time to the late window on Sunday, a game that was lighting up early and often when numbers were first posted, that would be Carolina traveling to Seattle to take on the Seahawks. At Chris, a.k.a. bookmaker for the U.S. audience, Seattle opened a six-and-a-half-point favorite. Circa opened the Seahawks a five-point favorite. This one's down to Seattle minus three and a half pretty much across the board. Suma, what do you make of the market surge on Carolina in their matchup against the Seahawks? Yeah, one way um, Panthers action so far, I think that the Marcus market found a plateau at three and a half. I would be surprised if this got to uh, Seahawks minus three in general. We are seeing some minus fours on the screen right now. Uh, Chris is at minus three and a half, minus 15. The Seahawks defense looked very, very bad in recent weeks. Before their bye week, they played the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers scored 21 points along with a red zone turnover. And the Bucs offense struggled in almost every other game. They could not score more than 70 points against the Browns. They struggled to score 70 points against the Saints um, on Monday Night Football. So those 21 points along with a red zone turnover against the Seahawks defense looks even worse for the Seahawks, in my opinion, right now. Um, last week, it was Rams with a backup quarterback, arguably the worst offensive line in football, Ben Jefferson as their wide receiver one, and they moved the ball quite easily on the Seahawks defense. With the Panthers offense looking a little bit better with Sam Darnold, they had a decent game against the Broncos, uh, defense against a good Broncos defense. I think that the market has some hope about the prospects of the Panthers' offense. Uh, their offensive line got, got a little bit better. Their run game is uh, not terribly anymore. Uh, DJ Moore is a weapon. So I think that the market is telling us there is a path 
for the Panthers to have some offensive success against a bad Seahawks defense. And therefore, anything from plus six to plus four and a half was probably too much in the eyes of the market. As you broke down that game, you touched on a Bucks offense that we can touch on perhaps a bit more in this next one. Tampa Bay taking on San Francisco. And the look ahead line in this one was Niners minus six and a half. Again, with a quarterback injury that can shuffle things in a major way. Sumo, with look ahead lines, there has been quite a bit of talk from a lot of respected betters that I've heard over the course of this season that with limited availability and lower limits, there's not too much that we should maybe read into them. And at the same time, look aheads do seem to be gaining in terms of popularity and availability. So all in all, what do you make of seeing this look ahead line of Niners minus six and a half dropping down to a current number of San Francisco laying three and a half at even money? Very interesting downgrade i would say um you mentioned it that we should not put too much stock uh, on look ahead lines because limits are low um we don't know how many sharp betters are actually betting into those i mean last week the um, vikings were laying almost minus three um at detroit on the look ahead line and this is now almost completely flipped so we cannot put too much stock, but it's probably, but it's also interesting to have some of a some kind of a reference point. Um, it was minus six for the, for the 49ers, or even mi minus six and a half uh, with Jimmy Garoppolo. Now we are looking at minus three and a half. It was minus four yesterday morning that we had a kind of a strong move for a Tuesday across the board um, on the box, bringing this down to almost minus three. But then we had a, a another another small push of Niners money that brought it to um, minus three and a half, minus 08 at, at Chris right now. Um, I mean, Brock Purdy is laying more than a field goal against Tom Brady is probably, probably my favorite storyline of the week. No matter whether you like the Bucks or the 49ers in this game, it's, it's, it's just so fascinating that Mr. Real, Mr. Real, irrelevant is laying three and a half points against Tom Brady. It will be a different game for Brock Purdy because now Todd Bowles and his defense, they have a full week to prepare. Uh, they saw some tape on him. Um, on, the, on the other side, um, that Bucks offense is not looking fluent, good at all. They have some crazy coaching issues, in my opinion, because Todd Bowles is very conservative. Byron Leftwich, um, Byron Leftwich offense uh, looks bad for three quarters until Tom Brady has to throw the ball late in the game. So, um, yeah, pretty interesting uh, market move, movement to follow, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's very hard to say whether this might get to three because of how bad the, the Bucks have looked recently on offense. And you talk about Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, suddenly in quite the relevant role for the 49ers, laying more than a field goal against Tom Brady, being, a, you know, a fun topic to follow this week. I got to say, I'm kind of surprised the Niners aren't laying a touch more in this one. Just having seen this line hover around four points after the Monday Night Football game, we saw a masterclass from Dennis Allen and the Saints just showing endgame incompetence, gifting a win to Tampa Bay. <laughs> Was that really enough to move this game off of the four once we already knew that it was Brock Purdy for the Niners against Tom Brady for the Bucks, Or was there anything else that you see driving this line down just a bit further, threatening to go down to three? I mean, it's a game with a very low total. And Tom Brady and a decent defense are getting four points against Brock Purdy. I think this is probably what drive or what drove some betters to grab the four here with, with the Buccaneers on the road against uh, Sturdy Purdy's first ever NFL start. Fair enough. Well, from Sturdy Purdy to two quarterbacks who were drafted much earlier than the seventh round, Sunday Night Football, Miami against the Chargers, Tua versus Herbert. The Dolphins opened a short two-point favorite. That is up to minus three, minus 120. So this one is threatening to cross all the way through the key number of three in favor of Miami. And Suma, in your Week 13 recap, you touched on the fact that the Dolphins' offense was let down by Tua last week in San Francisco. I think we can kiss those MVP chances goodbye for Tua. And on the other side of the ball, the Dolphins' defense also becoming problematic as the season progresses. 
Yet we've seen quite the power move on the Dolphins in this matchup. And I think that says about all you need to know about the current state of the Chargers. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I watched, I rewatched the Chargers um, Waders game uh, yesterday, and <laughs> the Chargers had a pick six early in the game, and they had that ridiculous touchdown throw on fourth and 12. I mean, they basically scored um, six offensive points without some, let's call it fluky stuff. Right, so they had one one touchdown, or one true offensive touchdown on fourth and twelve when the game was already over, or basically over, and their defense cannot stop almost anyone at, at this point right now. So this is going to be a completely different game for the Dolphins' offense. First of all, they they should have less issues um, this time, and I also don't expect to attack by Loa to miss eight wide open receivers uh, again. Um, on the other hand, um, there are some injuries to monitor throughout the week, uh, which could have some impact on, on, on further market movement because the Chargers still have Corey Lindsley in the, con in the concussion protocol, Trey Pipkins, their right tackle is day to day, and Mike Williams is expected to practice, but we don't know yet whether he's going to play. If all of those three guys are in, I can easily see the market pushing this back towards three but if those guys are out ah oh man it's, it's, it's really rough to i think ignore the dolphins at minus three if those guys are out because if we expect the the dolphins to score their defense is not great but i mean that scheme by joel lombardi is so bad and i i watched a video from pro football focus from, from mike renner today he um, dove a little bit in, in, into those route combinations on, on some key third downs late in the game. And everything is just four routes isolated down the field. And it really reminded me of a Jason Garrett offense. It, it's a completely waste of time, in my opinion, to have Justin Herbert uh, throw to four isolated routes down the field where no one gets open against man coverage. And as bad as the Dolphins' defense is, they play the style of defense, so if Mike Williams, Williams is out, Herbert will once again be forced to try to hit Keenan Allen on, on a stand route, and I doubt that this will um, make up for, uh, for four quarters against the Dolphins if, if all those guys are out. That comparison to a Jason Garrett offense really hits home with me in a way that I hoped I wouldn't feel this season as a Chargers fan. I, I just feel like... I'm pretty much done with this year's Chargers team. And I don't know, feeling closer and closer to done with Joe Lombardi and perhaps even Brandon Staley every day. If the Cowboys can keep it going strong, then maybe Sean Payton could make his way to Southern California instead of to Dallas to patrol the sidelines next season. So maybe that's something Chargers fans can keep their fingers crossed for. But at this stage, we have pretty much done all we can as far as the week 14 betting market is concerned at this point in the week. We'll skip Fabian's forecast again this week because once again, we've covered more than half the board in this game by game rundown. So everybody can read between the lines, if you will, to see where Fabian might be leaning as far as where the market is heading in some of these key matchups. And with that, guys, let's wrap things up as we always do with the hops. Jacob, we'll lead off with you. What's been your best drinking experience since we last recorded between the lines? So really good drinking experiences from the weekend on Sunday in particular. I uh, had a good day overall. Football was on. England won their World Cup game. And then I headed down to downtown Toronto where uh, I had some good hops experience to cushion the loss on a big Miami bet that I had after Tua, as Suma alluded to, did not perform as you would expect him to. But that was cushioned, like I said, by a beer town in Toronto. Uh, as you can tell from the name, they got a lot of good beer. And what me and my friends ordered up was a bit of a mouthful. It's called the Beer Mageddon Paddletron 3000. It's about a four to five foot long paddle, 30 different five ounce beers, arranging from <laughs> lagers to IPAs to a whole bunch of different things, sours. And really, a lot of it is really good beer. There's some really bad ones on the list, but uh, it's fun splitting that with a group of four people. You get 
eight, seven or eight each. Maybe some other viewers may want to go with more people than just that. But yeah. really good experience with some great beer on that. And just having some uh, such a different array of flavors paired with some really good food was uh, an amazing experience for Sunday night. Man, yeah, a group of four or five sounds a bit light for yeah. that much beer, <laughs> but I guess when in Rome, you got to just go for it. It sounds like quite the experience. Yeah, I had a I had a friend I went to uh, university with. I live uh, in southern Ontario. He's in Ottawa, and he was down for the day, so we, uh, we went out with him. Sounds like a good time, if nothing else, with quite the variety of beers on hand. And I had a, a much smaller volume, <laughs> but a similar variety, let's say, last week. I touched on it Friday, was looking forward to a Christmas parade that my small town had over the weekend. And my wife and I turned that into our de facto Christmas party before and after having some friends and family over at our house. And one thing I was surprised to see when we were making a beer run before the parade, before we had some people over, I found one of my favorite beers, Saison DuPont, in a can for the first time. I had only ever seen it packaged in bottles. And there's a saying that you drink with your eyes first when there's really eye-catching can art that can definitely pop off the shelf. That was certainly the case with this can of Saison DuPont that I found. They've got a pretty iconic white and yellow checkered pattern, some green text tying it in with the NFL, a bit of a Green Bay Packers color scheme, if you will. <laughs> but getting to the beer itself, Saison DuPont is a classic Belgian farmhouse ale. And to me, it captures the essence of the style. In fact, if you Google the word Saison, the first image you will see is Saison DuPont. This beer is made by Brasserie DuPont in Belgium. So a bit closer to Suma's neck of the woods than you or I, Jacob. But anytime any of the three of us can get our hands on it or any of the listeners can get their hands on it, would highly recommend doing so. Saison DuPont clocks in at 6.5% ABV. And while this is the hop segment, I'll say for this beer, the hops take a bit of a backseat to the yeast. The yeast really driving a lot of what's great about the Saison style. Notes of fresh baked bread, citrus, and spice. And with all that, it pairs well with just about any food, as evidenced by the fact that I paired some Saison DuPont with Chinese food that we were sharing at the house after the Christmas parade. And a Belgian beer with a Chinese dinner might not sound like a match made in heaven, but it certainly got the job done. Sumo, as I toss it over to you, I want to note that last week after we recorded, you had an interesting point to make about a malt wine. And you sent Jacob and I some really intriguing photos in our Telegram chat, wondering if you might have had a chance to enjoy any of that in the past week, or if you could explain for an audience outside of Germany what exactly that is and why it's so good this time of year. Yeah, so in Germany, it's, it's a big tradition uh, to uh, drink. It's called Glühwein in German, uh, I think malted wine in English, is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think malt uh, wine, yeah, was the translation we got to. Yeah, so it's basically, let's say, warm or heated wet wine, but it's specifically produced for this uh, kind of process of heating it up. So it's not like you, you take some, some common, let's say, French wet wine and you, you heat it up, that would not taste as good. Uh, but it's a very traditional um, drink, uh, especially before Christmas on all those Christmas markets. And I had one or two last Friday. And what, what I also had um, on Sunday while watching NFL was a whiskey. And maybe I can bring in some whiskey tasting in here. Um, I had a uh, Glenfiddich, uh, 50 years old, from, from Scotland from the region Speyside, um, one of my favorites, to be honest. And I will just quote what it um, um, smells like. An intriguingly complex aroma, sweet heather honey and vanilla fudge combined with rich dark fruits. I can highly recommend this, um, one of my favorite uh, whiskeys. Um, those were my two, um, let's say, major experiences last week. Goodness. Well, from Jacob's uh, borderline irresponsible quantity of beers sampled over the weekend <laughs> to my uh, Belgian farmhouse ale to Sumo's whiskey, I think we've got a lot of the bases covered as far as the hops are concerned, along with the NFL Week 14 slate. So that'll do it for this week's episode of Between the Lines. If you're not already doing so, cannot recommend highly enough that you follow Suma on Twitter at Suma810. That's S-U-U-M-A-810. You can also follow me at mlandis18. 
Thanks everybody for tuning into this week's episode. And Jacob and I will be back on Friday with Hitman for our NFL Week 14 prop betting breakdown. Props and ups and cops and-